All right, I'm just going to be running through a brief overview of uh, wilderness medicine. Obviously, most of us don't usually do this by PowerPoint, but it kind of uh, comes with the territory this morning, so I will be brief. Um, very low key. If anybody has any questions, please stop me. So I'm going to be quickly speaking about what is wilderness medicine. I think we suffer from poor nomenclature. A lot of people um, have a hard time saying, well, what is wilderness medicine? And I think they uh, very narrowly define it in a way that's not helpful to what we actually do. Talk briefly about where it's come from and how it's rapidly advanced, uh, most notably at SAM. So this is the 10th SAM meeting in which there's been a wilderness medicine interest group. First was in Phoenix 10 years ago. And so things have moved uh, very rapidly along. So I, I came up with this definition just because I, I didn't like any of the others that existed. Um, about 15 years ago, but I used the Venn diagrams of the provision of resource-limited medicine under austere conditions. And where those two uh, diagram overlap is where we are active. I'm going to talk about where that is. I'm often also asked, oh, wilderness medicine, that's so new and cool. It's brand, um, it, it hadn't existed before. And my feeling is, when I'm asked where was the first school of wilderness medicine, that it started on a small little island off the coast of Greece about 2,400 years ago when a doctor sat down outside with a patient under a tree, did a good physical and a good history, and came up with a differential and treated the human being in front of them. Um, so I think the kind of history of Western medicine and of wilderness medicine are pretty directly overlaid. And that a large part of my efforts within wilderness medicine are to try to bring that humanism back to the bedside. So it's directly applicable to what happens in the hospital. Uh, people, I throw this slide up there. Um, just so I joked with our fellows and residents in the past, don't pull a Mosley. So Mosley, uh, I always felt kind of sorry for the guy, but he fell off the Matterhorn and died. Uh, in, I think, 79, 78, 1878. But the more I've gotten to know about him, he was like the original dirtbag climber doctor guy. Um, at that point, the great medical centers of the world were in Europe. And so while he was at Harvard Med, he would go and do his time in Berlin and in Vienna, and meanwhile was climbing his tail off, unfortunately not always successfully. Um, so people have been working at getting to this for a very long time. So again, back to where do we practice? Obviously, we practice uh, in wilderness areas as defined by the US Congress in 63 as places where humans don't permanently remain. So that can be in Denali. Um, it can be out on the tundra in Alaska, working with the Woods Hole Research Center. It can be as a daily course of business throughout the developed world. So it doesn't have to be non-inhabited. Um, sometimes these places have been continuously habited for 10,000 years, and yet they're still resource limited and under austere conditions. <clears throat> it can be in the first world, in the developed world, after a natural or uh, man-made disaster. Here's Dr. Phillips uh, leading the, the charge in Nepal in 15 after the giant earthquake uh, destroyed what was already a fragile medical system. And then on into your very own well-lighted ED is where wilderness medicine has huge application. Why wilderness medicine? I'm sometimes asked, chairs and other people who are um, trying to get their heads around why this is useful. My feeling is that the current model where we've built these giant boxes that patients have to present to to receive medical care um, is backward, that we're at a time now, we have the skills, we have the tools, we can be extending care anywhere on the globe we need to. So expanding access to care is something emergency physicians um, are very proud of and we work very hard 24 seven when the rest of the world goes to sleep or goes on vacation. Um, and this is just the next step of that, to reach out into the world um, and to care for patients under conditions that most doctors couldn't take care of themselves. We teach essential medicine, and again, getting back to that idea of 2,400 years ago, uh, sitting down with one human doctor and one human patient, making that contact, uh, not putting a laptop between them and the patient, but actually listening. And it doesn't have to be a prolonged session, but actually listening to the patient in front of them, 
uh, in using a good physical exam and then, God forbid, using their brain before they start firing off tests um, to make a diagnosis is it's better medicine and it's something we can teach outside and take inside. These uh, strategies, we've just run the 15th iteration of our Medicine in the Wild class, my senior medical student course um, that a lot of people at that back table have uh, taught. And uh, the skills I keep being told by people who've now been in practice for uh, as attendings for five, ten years, uh, that you know what we learned out there just as far as patient assessment skills, it's the best course I had in med school. And so I think just the ability to simplify things, to break things down, those skills are completely durable and transferable from the outside to the inside. Again, just in the brief 20 years I've been around, the change from Patients who inevitably used to be admitted to the ICU are now admitted to the floor, who used to be admitted to the floor now in the OBS unit are, you know, going home. And I think that's not necessarily at all a bad uh, evolution that having had uh, elderly parents who are physicians um, but recently engaged with the medical system, you know, staying out of the hospital, that's a noble goal. You don't want to go into the hospital if you don't absolutely have to. And we're getting to the point that we can treat and diagnose people outside of the hospital, which purely selfishly, as an emergency physician with patients boarding, that's not a bad thing, but we're here for the patient and to see how patient care can be uh, rendered very successfully and probably better um, sometimes at home than in the hospital is a noble goal, and that's some of what we offer. Some of the ways we offer this is working on new tools. A large part of the thrust of our group's work has been working on uh, developing either new technologies or innovative uses of existing technologies. So when we first, Peter Fagenholtz uh, was a surgeon who did a couple of years research with me and did a lot of the early ultrasound work outside of the hospital, and people were like, you know, these are freaking expensive machines, they're fragile, you don't have a power source, you know, you can't take these things outside, that is just not right. Um, and we were able to sneak one out and do so. And, and now it's just standard of care, it's just obvious. Um, and so ways that we fall into habits of, of, it's just we do it, or we've done it in the past, and so that mental leap of, wait, we can do things differently, um, is something that we need to push on in that wilderness medicine is good about pushing on. We've got that little cardboard box down there is a portable magnetic resonance device that Sam Pat's a buddy is working on. So there's some cool technologies out there. The butterfly, you know, now we're getting to the point that taking an ultrasound in the field is a, a very low risk venture. And again, just to say the idea of taking an ultrasound outside of the hospital 15 years ago was crazy talk and now it uh, doesn't even go noticed. Some of the ways, too, that we can uh, offer a lot to the larger house of medicine. So a large part of our research is uh, hypoxia, how the body responds to low oxygen states, and then the health impacts of climate change and human health, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But since we are very often comfortable in environments where other doctors, other researchers are completely not comfortable, it gives you a research niche that's uh, pretty easy to exploit. And so we uh, were approached about three years ago now by Vamsi Muth and uh, Warren Zapal, respectively one of the top mitochondrial researchers on the planet and the former chair of anesthesia at MGH, who's done a lot of research uh, on hypoxia uh, in Antarctica on Waddell seals. But they had some cool mouse findings on mitochondrial disease, and they're like, holy crap, you know, could we apply this to humans? You know, who does crazy stuff like taking patients to very low oxygen saturations. It's like, oh, Stuart does. Um, and so they reached out to us, which is really nice, and there are a bunch of opportunities like that, that if you're an expert in an area where, you know, the vast herds don't tend to go, then you have an expertise and a skill set um, that it's quite marketable and you are able to contribute to people a hell of a lot smarter than I am <coughs> in, uh, in ways that are productive. And so we're now running, for, uh, just ran the very first inside clinical trial I've ever done in my life, and it is so freaking easy um, as compared to doing something out on Kilimanjaro or Everest or wherever else. Um, it's, it's really nice, and so you can do it. Things, and these are just a bunch of ideas, uh, things that we're working on and maybe to sponsor some ideas in you. Um, but one of the things I would love to see us be able to pull off 
is a, a new diagnosis for the acute effects of hypoxia on the brain. Uh, so right now we call it acute mountain sickness, which is a purely subjective uh, listing of symptoms. I would love for us to be able to come up with an objectively based syndromic diagnosis. Um, so just like we diagnose acute coronary syndrome with a mix of characteristic pain, so you got the subjective, but then you also have objective findings of characteristic EKG findings, biomarkers. It's like why in the hell in the 21st century can we not take what is ultimately one of the premier life threats, acute hypoxia, so whether it's stroke or heart attack or lung disease, trauma and lack of oxygen avail availability, why can we not do that with, uh, with acute mountain sickness? And so we've been working on things like cognitive impairment as an objective tool, working with VAMSI and uh, the Broad Institute, looking at novel biomarkers for CNS injury, um, so to try to come up with an objective diagnosis. And again, fun things like the magnetic resonance device that you can put in a backpack, that would be cool. A uh, large part of what we do, and I, I think is a huge responsibility for us as physicians, just uh, I see medicine as the most human of the sciences. We routinely take discrete scientific information. You know, your A1C of 14, it's like that has zero meaning to a patient unless we can put it into a narrative. We can put it into a story. We're a narrative-driven species. We're not a data-driven species. We don't become... Americans or Virginians or marry who we marry or become a parent because the data argue that we should do this. It's the stories we've been told and it's the stories we tell. And I think that's one way that uh, medicine, it's been remiss, we're slowly changing it, but the ability to take data about human health as it's being impacted by a changing environment and to put that into a, a narrative that patients that the public can understand so that policy can be changed. It's just something we need to be doing. We have failed at that, and it's our job to care for the patient, and that doesn't have to be one patient at a time. It can be the public health implications of things that are happening right now. This isn't we're worried about the future. It's happening right now. And part of that is getting out and advocating, using your voice. Physicians are uniquely positioned uh, by a couple centuries of habit to uh, be respected. We've got fiscal resources, which in D.C. never hurts if you want to be listened to. Um, so getting out and advocating for what is purely rational, apolitical, uh, good policy as far as climate change and its impact on human health is something we need to be doing more of. And the last part of this, I think, is uh, pretty important, um, and especially coming from a very first world nation that's created a lot of the problems, is some sense of climate justice and the fact that as in it is almost inevitably the case, uh, people who have created, uh, contributed the least to problems are oftentimes the ones that get most screwed by the outcomes. And so, anybody name that little island nation down there? And the flag which attends it? Um, it's Kiribati. Um, looks like it should be Kiribati, but Kiribati is uh, an atoll nation in the south Pacific that uh, they're already educating their population with the anticipation that their island nation is going to disappear um, within the next 40 to 60 years. Um, and so they, these are people whose homes are, are going bye-bye and they're already educating um, their citizens largely as health care providers in New Zealand and Australia so when their nation is no more uh, they can continue on. Uh, part of uh, ways you can contribute, you can do it by policy. That's the uh, Attorney General of Massachusetts. She reached out to us recently um, on some uh, legislative and litigative work. So there are all kinds of different ways that you can contribute. If you take any one thing from my brief time up here today is that you have tremendous power and you can make a difference. And it is incumbent upon you to use uh, the special place that you have. How do we do what we do? We, uh, we teach, we do research, we provide clinical care. Uh, again, outreach and advocacy are kind of bread and butter for what we do, and we ought to do it having fun. If you're not having fun, something is wrong. Um, lift up your eyes into the hills and there's uh, plenty of fun to be had. And our, our model is anywhere we're doing one of the above, teaching clinical care, um, 
or research, we ought to be doing all of them. And we've done it kind of broadly based, and I think you can too. You don't want to get lost out on a, a semi-snowy day on the tundra in Alaska. How do you teach? We kind of teach the run from very first introductions to medicine up to attending level CME. The goals of the fellowship are varied. We're up to now 19 fellowships in the country. Um, and it's nice in that, uh, in a good ecological sense, each one is uh, really grows out of the environment in which it lives. So ours in Boston is very different from Isabel's. Uh, in California is different from uh, Henderson's in North Carolina. So they're all uh, playing to their strength and their strengths and their specialties, uh, which is nice. In 2005, there were two fellowships in the country. Uh, right now, I didn't add the last one up there because I don't know if they've publicly announced, but I can promise you there are now 19 fellowships that will be accepting fellows uh, in the next year. You can see broadly distributed across the country, both coast, middle America, um, north, south. So it's, uh, it's good to see things moving ahead. Part of how we move ahead is defining our body of expertise. Uh, Dr. Farkas Cushing and I spent a, <laughs> a happy couple of years helping to contribute to those efforts. Um, and uh, the nice thing is you get to go to nice places, and uh, there's some interesting people out there, and if you're the least bit curious, which God forbid you should go into medicine if you're not, um, you know, you, you can go and ask good questions uh, and think with smart people and get paid to do it, which is a pretty good way to go through the planet. Uh, my last little bit, this is uh, Warren again. He is a chair of a major MGH clinical department, was disappearing to Antarctica for a month or two every year on an NSF-funded research project looking at the dive response of Waddell seals. So these cute little seals that would, uh, you know, be bobbing around on the surface and look so cute and then dive 800 feet down, stay there for 40 minutes and come up, still looking very cute. Um, and so figuring out ways that uh, physiology has figured out how to deal with extraordinary hypoxia and protect the squash is uh, something that we're both interested in. But he said this to me, and I think it's pretty good advice. He said, just start, go out and do weird and wonderful things, and people will love you. And I think that is uh, what I would like to leave you with here today. Thank you. <laughs>